new topic for this next week, um, that being a recap of things we've already done. In other words, we're trying to get better at what we're doing. Reminds me a lot of another lecture I shared with you similar to this. I see the, the continuum, the process that we go through, about five steps, and I think this is step four. It seems to me that we could put all our business related items in a box and accumulate them. Or we could record all our business related items in terms of the accounting equation. And we tried that in chapter one and found it to be good, useful, but not real efficient. And I remember coming in to the beginning of chapter two saying, we need to get better at this. And we introduced you to the debit credit mechanism and we've been recording transactions that way ever since. And that's what this lecture reminds me a little of. I'm proposing that that's not a real efficient way to do it. I think that we could improve this process and I'd like to introduce you to some time-saving devices. They're, in, they're to record the same transactions we've been recording. There are no new transactions in this week. In fact, this will look very familiar. If you learned what we hoped you would learn in the previous two chapters about buyer's point of view and seller's point of view, you should already know how to do the journal entries that we're recording. And that should be reassuring for a lot of you. This chapter is full of procedures. It's just little details about how we could make this process better, how we could handle a greater volume of transactions and have more information when we're finished with it. And I think this is one step along the continuum to ultimately recording transactions on the computer to allow computer software to do it. The name of the chapter is accounting systems or something like that. How are we going to arrange the company in order that we could get better at and record the transactions that we need to? There are two major things we're introducing this week and they are specialized journals and subsidiary ledgers. Both of these are intended in their own way to in increase our efficiency, to help us record more transactions with less effort and more efficiency. We want to get better at it, and in doing so, we're going to have more information. Because it's new to you, the irony of this is that your homework may take you a little bit longer than it has in the past, and you're saying, oh brother, how could it take any longer? But it might, okay? But I keep emphasizing we'll have more information when we're finished than we did before. Let's look at specialized journals and subsidiary ledgers and see how they can help. A glance back. What's the problem with having the one journal that we've had up to now? If we have just one journal, then only one person can work on it at a time. That means that the thousands of transactions that Walmart across the street is entering into at this moment, or all day today, would have to be recorded by one little person sitting in the back room getting a cramp in their hand writing so fast. Y'all with me here? That's just not a real efficient way to do it. And the book in which we're writing this would ultimately become so big It'd throw your back out to lift it up off the floor and put it on the desk for you to work. This is a ridiculous way to do it. We don't want, in this age of technology, to write each and every one of these transactions in the format that we have. The solution is to analyze the company and to see that there is a lot of commonality in the entries that we record. We need to allow people to become specialists in what they do. Break up the workload and share it among individuals. And when we do so, a lot of people can record transactions. They can get a lot better at them because of the way that we design the journals. Specialized journals are intended to accomplish just that. Specialized journals will 
save us a little time journalizing, and we're all in the saving time. But the key to that is that special journals will save us a lot of time posting. That's the most important thing today. There are lots of important things today. But the most important thing today is for you to be certain that you know how to use a specialized journal so that it will save you time. We need to be able to accomplish saving a lot of time. And it happens today and it happens in your homework. And it's a really, really important concept we'd like for you to know. The two topics are specialized journals and subsidiary ledgers. Up until this moment, we've had one ledger. We called it the general ledger. What's wrong with having one ledger? Well, if we have just one ledger, only one person can post at a time. That, in a large business with a lot of volume, is a lot of responsibility and work for that one individual. And if we just have one ledger, that ledger may become so big. Does this sound familiar? Have we been here before today? This is the same problem we're trying to solve, it seems, but it's not the same solution. This time, we're going to propose that instead of having one ledger with all the accounts that we need, that we break it down and have some subsidiary ledgers for some common, similar material. And in doing so, that will cause us to have to post a little more often to keep them up to date. And that's where a little more effort comes, but that's also where we conclude at the end we have more information than we did before. We want to keep up with this information anyway. Let me see if I can get across to you the idea of a subsidiary ledger. Let's say that each of these lines represents a page in a book, a ledger, the general ledger, for a store like Sears. I don't know for sure if Sears still has their own accounts, but I think they do. They have their own account receivable. You can have a Sears charge card, and you owe Sears. You don't owe a bank or someplace else. So as you examine this general ledger, would you conclude with me at the beginning of this that the general ledger is in balance or is not in balance? What do you think? In balance or not? Have an opinion, say it out loud. It's probably in balance, don't you think? <coughs> Debits and credits equal in the general ledger for Sears, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Let's start with the premise the general ledger is in balance. And as we examine the accounts in the general ledger, it appears that some of them are similar. Do you see the ones that are alike there? The red ones, yes or no? Yes. So I'm going to say that those represent the individual account receivable account for every customer of Sears that owes them money. And maybe that's what's making this book be so large. If Sears really had a hand-posted system, if Sears really had an individual sheet of paper for everybody that owed them money, and all the other pages that they needed in their general ledger, that book might not fit in this room. Do you understand what I just said? And I'm letting these red lines represent those. The idea of a subsidiary ledger is let's find some that have some similar characteristics. If you're not looking right this minute, would you? And let's take those and put them over in another book and call that other book the subsidiary ledger. Figuratively, what I just tried to do was take all the account receivable accounts and put them over in their own subsidiary ledger, the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Now, one of the questions that comes from this is, does this general ledger, which is now a whole lot smaller than it was, does it balance? Do debits and credits equal? Say yes or no. Yes. yes. You missed out on a concept. If I took one account out of that, if you were preparing a trial balance in your homework and you left 
one account out, would the trial balance balance? But I took a whole bunch of them out and asked you whether or not it balanced, and you said it did. Apparently, you weren't thinking. If I take all of these out, will the trial balance balance, yes or no? No. No? So, in my effort to make things better, I've made them worse, temporarily. So, why don't we replace all of those accounts that we just took out with one account called accounts receivable. Its characteristic is that it's a control account. It has summary information in it, the details of which are available in the subsidiary ledger. So the amount that each customer <coughs> owes us is outlined in the subsidiary ledger. We know what every person owes us, the balance of their account. But the sum of all of those is replaced in the general ledger with one account, the accounts receivable control account. Are you with me, yes or no? Yes. In order for us to keep the control account and the subsidiary ledger equal with one another, it will be our responsibility to post to both those things. We'll post the details buying and selling and buying and selling and paying on time and returning and all of those things in the subsidiary ledger for that particular customer. But we'll post total information to the control account and then each day or each month we'll make sure that the information in the subsidiary and the information in the control account agree with one another. You'll be asked to do that in your homework to make sure that what you've done in the subsidiary ledger will equal the balance of the accounts receivable control account. Lots of companies do this. It's a good check and balance. It gives us assurance of the accuracy of our work in the same way that we like it when we know that the trial balance is in balance. We're going to like it when we find out that the control and the subsidiary ledger agree with one another. So, we could apply the very same concept to accounts payable. Accounts receivable and accounts payable are ripe for having a subsidiary ledger. Now, this is the official introduction to this control subsidiary ledger thing. But I <coughs> teased you about it in a previous chapter. I think it was two Mondays ago when we started talking about inventory procedures, FIFO and LIFO. And it was then that I introduced merchandise inventory to you as a control account that would have a subsidiary ledger that we would need to post to the subsidiary ledger and the control account. So we've really got three. Under perpetual procedures, merchandise inventory is a control that has a subsidiary. And now we are introducing accounts receivable and accounts payable to that understanding. <coughs> accounts receivable and accounts payable are the obvious places where we can, record, we can implement this methodology in our business. Our main topic this week is special journals. Special journals can save you a little time journalizing and a lot of time posting. Let's talk about what characteristics we have observed in our business that we could break this apart and allow people to specialize in their ability to record transactions most efficiently. Let's talk about the design of the journal, what columns we should have in them to accomplish this as well. <coughs> One of the things that we do in a merchandising concern is buy things. There are two ways that we could design a purchases journal. I've seen in real life the most, the most applications of this one is a multi-column purchases journal where you can buy lots of things on account. If you buy merchandise, it'll fit here. If you buy supplies, it'll fit here. If you buy equipment, it'll fit here. Anything you buy could go there. I'm not sure why the book doesn't allow us to see and have a purchases journal like that, a multi-column purchases <coughs> journal in the illustrations and in our homework assignments. I think it's the one used most often in real life. 
The book's version of this is a single column purchases journal. That's the only one you're going to have the opportunity to see. We're going to define the criteria so narrowly that only one particular kind of transaction will fit there. In order for something to fit in the purchases journal, it's got to be a purchase, it's got to be merchandise, it's got to be on account. If it meets all three of those criteria, you can save time journalizing and posting by putting it in the purchases journal. If you buy merchandise for cash, it doesn't go here. If you buy equipment on account, it won't go here. If you buy supplies on account, it won't go here. Is anybody making sense out of this? Yes or no? Yes. Only a purchase of merchandise on account can be recorded in the purchases journal. <coughs> One of the things we do often in a business is sell things. We hope that's our bread and butter. That's our reason for existence. We ought to have a sales journal that would have columns to accommodate a sale of merchandise on account. It's got to be all three things. If you sell land, it doesn't go here. If you sell merchandise for cash, it won't go here. Only a sale of merchandise on account goes here. We are going to design the journals in a few minutes to accomplish these specific criteria. As we look around at the kinds of transactions we enter into, one of the things we notice is that one of the things we do often is collect money. Getting money, receiving cash, can be recorded in the cash receipts journal. The cash receipts journal should be designed to accommodate any collection of cash. In a few minutes, we'll talk about how to design the journals. But when you see the word any in the descriptions of the journals, we've built in, we will build in some flexibility in a column called other. Some businesses call it general or sundry. I think we call it other. So that if we put it in the other column, we have to specifically name the account like we used to when we wrote out the transactions in the format that we knew before today, general journal format, where we named the exact account titles. There'll be a column where we can do that too. The bulk of the transactions, however, will be recorded in special columns, which will save us time journalizing and save us a lot of time posting when we use them correctly. Finally, of the special journals, the one that remains is the cash payments journal. The cash payments journal, if you've been listening and thinking, you're probably anticipating where we're going with this. Any disbursement of cash will go in the cash payments journal. What about things that don't fit in any of these? The first thing you need to do is try to put them in one of these journals. Every transaction will go in the journal that we've been using. We've been recording every transaction there. We should know that. There is no efficiency in recording transactions in the general journal. We don't want to put things in the general journal ex unless we have to. Only exceptions should go there. If you've tried every one of these journals and it won't fit in any of those other places, then it'll always fit in the general journal. We'd like to save the general journal for unusual things. Adjusting entries or correcting entries. Closing entries at the end of the year. Credit memos and debit memos would probably fit best in the general journal. But as you anticipate what you're going to do in your homework or what you might do in a business someday, remember that we want to use the general journal as little as possible. We want to enter something in a special journal if we can. That's where the greatest efficiency occurs. Anybody thinking multiple choice yet? Do you see five multiple choice answers on the screen? Where would this transaction go? Or where would this transaction go? Or where would this transaction go? You could anticipate that. 
you need to know the criteria of the germs. Think about that as you're practicing in your homework an application for eventually having to answer questions in multiple choice format about. Now, as we think about implementing a special <coughs> journal and subsidiary ledger system in our company, can we go down to Office Depot on the corner of 71st and Lewis and buy columnar paper with names already assigned to the columns like you'll download from D2L to do this week's homework? Yes or no? We can buy columnar paper, but it won't have the names of the columns. So in my opinion, there's a missing link between you getting working papers where publishers have already decided what the names of the columns should be and giving you transactions to record in a homework problem and you just write numbers in columns. Do you understand what I'm describing right now? There is the chance that you could end the week knowing less than you did at the beginning of the week if you just slap numbers in columns and don't realize what you're doing. I'd like to think about these blank sheets of paper that we bought and the criteria for the journals that we just established and have you help me design those journals. At least give me a minimal amount of names of columns that we should anticipate being there. If the purchases journal is specifically designed to record a purchase of merchandise on account, what column would I need for sure? Over here, somebody? Accounts payable. It says I bought it on account. I for sure need an accounts payable account. Would it be accounts payable debit or accounts payable credit? I guess the key to this is for you to think about how you would journalize it if you were writing it out as a debit and a credit the way you always have. What entry would you make if you purchase merchandise on account? And by the way, we've had two choices, perpetual and periodic, for the last three weeks of class. And Unless the book says otherwise, we're going to assume perpetual for now, from now on. It would be the exception that we were using periodic. We're going to always assume that we're using perpetual procedures unless otherwise stated. So make me an entry. Purchase merchandise on account perpetual procedures would, <coughs> I'm going to take the answer I've already heard. Credit accounts payable and debit. <laughs> Inventory. Yes. Debit inventory, credit accounts payable. Then for sure we need an inventory column and for sure we need an accounts payable column. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about making up the names of the columns to suit us. We've established the criteria. Now let's write columns that would accommodate the transactions that meet those criteria. Any entry we make here, every invoice we process will debit purchases and credit accounts payable. Will debit purchases and credit accounts payable. Will, I'm saying purchases like it's periodic. Will debit inventory and credit accounts payable. Will debit inventory and credit accounts payable. Will debit inventory. This sounds like a broken record. I'm thinking efficiency. <coughs> I'm thinking, why write the same number twice? I'm thinking, if that's the same number every time, why couldn't I squeeze all that information into just one column and name the column debit inventory credit accounts payable? Anybody thinking with me this morning? Wouldn't that save some time? And you ought to be thinking, but Mr. Craig, you told us way back in chapter 2, every entry had to have a debit and a credit. So how would this be a debit and a credit? Well, wait until the end of the month. Sum the column, post the column total twice, once as a debit to inventory, once as a credit to accounts payable, and save time journalizing and save time posting. 
You see where we're going with this? Mm -hmm. We're looking for efficiency. I'd like to record more transactions with less effort. And it'll work. And that's how we reach the conclusion that it's a single column. They mean a single amount column. We're just going to write the amount once. And we're going to post it twice. And maintain the equilibrium of debits and credits. It's a good plan. Wesley? Is this assuming that the accounts payable equal the inventory? There's no like cash payment in part? Or no. This is the purchases journal that says it's a purchase of merchandise on account. Sure. The criteria established that it was very narrowly defined. It's only going to be this. If cash is involved, we enter it in one of the other journals. It was a good question. Let's talk about designing a sales journal. If we say the criteria for the sales journal is that it's got to be a sale, it's got to be merchandise, it's got to be on account, what journal entry would you make? If you read in the book or experienced in real life, I sold merchandise to a customer on account, what would you have done under perpetual procedures? <coughs> Daniel? Uh, your debit accounts receivable and credit sales account. When you bleep at the cash register, how many things happen under perpetual procedures class? Two. Two. You debit accounts receivable and credit sales, like Daniel says, and you debit cost of goods sold and credit cash. Inventory. It's inventory that walked out the room. So we need those columns. That's what I'm talking about. Design the journal to accommodate what you plan to do there. Let's talk about designing a cash receipts journal. What columns should we need? If we're receiving cash, for sure, the one column that we've got to have is cash. cash. Will it be cash debit or cash credit? It's the cash receipts journal. Debit. It'll be cash debit. You gotta be with me. <coughs> Come on, do some thinking right now. Name me some potential columns that would be credit. Name me the reasons for which you would collect cash. Come on, be creative. Name some. Yeah, money. Say it. Money. How about an accounts receivable column? That's what you just said. Somebody who owed us money, paid us money, an accounts receivable credit column is correct. Name me some reason we would collect cash. Chris? Yeah. If we sold goods for cash, we would need a sales column is correct. Why else would we collect cash? Say it. I think that'd be paying cash. This is receiving cash. How about we're a new business and the owner's having to put money in it continually to make the payroll? You know, our problem is to say, owner invested $10,000 or owner invested $50,000 or whatever it is. What if the owner invests a minimal amount and the business runs low on cash and he can't make the payroll, he has to take some out of his personal account and put it in the business? How about a John Doe Capital column? John Doe Capital credit? Yes or no? But if this is a well-established business, thriving, and the owner's not investing once a month or even that, we don't need a capital column. What if we're a landlord? What if we're one of eight businesses in a strip shopping center? We own the building and we have a business in one of those stores and it's full. How many, how many rent checks do I receive a month? Three. You gotta be at this. I got seven stores, uh, eight stores here, I'm in one of them. I'm going to get seven rent checks. That wasn't the important part. If I get more than one rent check, I'd want a cash debit column for every transaction and a rent revenue credit column. Yes? But I'm in a duplex kind of store. I'm in half of it and I rent out the other half. How many rent checks do I get a month? <laughs> Do I need a rent revenue column? I could have one, but I can write that in the other column. Either way, I'm going to have to post once. You have to post once if it happens. 
So if I have something that occurs more than once, I can save time with a special column. I can name the columns anything I want to. That's the lesson I'm trying to get you to see. Not pre-printed. Publishers don't sell their stuff at Office Depot. We've got to name the columns what we want to name them. But we don't have to just name them what the book named them. We can name them anything we want to to suit our circumstances. Did you understand the lesson about the rent revenue? Seven rent checks have a special column for it. One rent check, just put it in the other column. It'll work that way. Is there an other column in this journal? Yes, because the word any is in the description. It gives us the flexibility of anything we, anytime we collect money, we can record it in that journal. There's an other column. How about the cash payments chart? Name me one column for sure that you know you'd need. Quickly. Cash. Cash debit or cash credit? We're going to have to have a, you're getting the hang of this. It's a cash credit column. And then all the other columns are debit. Name me some reasons that we would pay cash. Accounts payable. If we pay on account, we need an accounts payable. Debit or credit? Yes. Debit. Name me a reason that we would pay cash. If we bought merchandise, we need an inventory column. If we buy supplies for cash, we need a supplies column. If we pay salaries more than once a month, we could have a salaries expense column. What if we don't own any buildings? What if I have one store and I pay rent to occupy the premises? Do I need a rent expense column? No, with one store I can put it in the other column. But what if I have five stores all over town and I don't own any buildings? I pay the rent on five stores. Do I need a rent expense column? I would save time journalizing and save time posting. That's the critical point. If I had a special column named rent expense, are you getting the flavor of why you have special columns in special journals? Say yes or no. Yes. yes. With a little inkling of how to design the journals, why they're going to say what they do when you look at the publisher's versions, I need to caution you about something. I've hinted at it already in the discussion today. There's a chance that you'll be worse off at the end of the week than you were at the beginning of the week in terms of your ability to read a transaction and to say what accounts are involved. Most students have the tendency to get their working papers and look at the columns, read the book, find out the amounts, slap numbers in the columns, and have no clue what they've done. My caution to you is for you to always think in general journal format. If you don't, there's a chance that you'll begin to lose the skill you've worked hard to develop. It may be cumbersome for you, but you really should think about making the entry in general journal form first, literally on a piece of scratch paper, or at least murmur it on your lips. I want a debit cash and I want a credit accounts receivable. Decide what to do first, just like you have the previous six chapters. And once you've decided on that, then think about the criteria we've established today to select the best journal in which to record that. Where is it going to be recorded most efficiently? And once you've done that, then and only then decide how it will be journalized and write it down in an appropriate format. Most of you are not convinced yet that I give good advice. Most of you will jump to this step and will fall into the trap that I've seen most previous students fall into. You still need to do some thinking this week so you can leave this week sound, still understanding the material. <clears throat> Let's practice a few. Let's see how it's going to look in your homework. On May 14th, we purchased merchandise from Faber and Son on account, $6,900.
when you walked in the room today, you knew to debit inventory and credit accounts payable. That's the old format that we were using before today. Knowing what you know now, in which journal could this be recorded best? Sales, purchases, cash receipts, cash payments, general journal, say something. Purchases. Didn't hear you. Purchases. This goes in the purchases journal. If you'd like to see one in your textbook, there's one on page 330. I reproduced it in the handout. If you're satisfied to see it there for now, you can see it there. If you want to look at the book later and see these examples, that'd be wise too. In the book, it looks like this. And what you need to learn right off is that we don't write out the account titles in the detail that we used to. We write the account titles once at the top of this single column. The book did that for you. But if you were doing it in real life, you'd write the name of the column. Debit inventory, credit accounts payable. And this particular entry is this one on the 14th. In special journals, most transactions will fit on one line. We need the date. We need to know to whom we sold the goods. In your homework, you have to do this to please the grader and to do what the book expected. In real life, I don't think this is necessary. We'd find that out someplace else. I, I think it's kind of funny that we're trying to promote this as a time-saving device, yet we put something that's going to take your time here unnecessarily. This you don't fill in yet, not at the time you journalize. You write the amount once. So really, the essentials are the name, the date, and the amount. Bam, bam, bam. Is that going to be faster? Sure it is. That's going to save us some time. But that's not where the greatest time saving occurs. At the end of the month, you're going to sum this. And instead of posting each of these twice as a debit and a credit, as a debit and a credit, as a debit and a credit, are you with me here? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 postings in a short little example are going to be posted once. When you post this total to inventory, you're going to put an account number under this to indicate you posted the total. And when you post this to accounts payable as a credit, you're going to put the account number of accounts payable there in your homework to say you have posted. Post the column total only. Save time. That's where the greatest time saving occurs. Earlier today, I said it saves a lot of time journalizing. That's the most, of, uh, a lot of time posting. It saves a lot of time. Be sure before you walk out of the room today that you know how to do that. We want to save time by posting the column total wherever we can. So if you compare the way we recorded it before and the way we're going to record it, we're accomplishing the same thing. But it's going to be a whole lot more efficient. So what if we read an entry in the book or experience in real life? Received a credit memo from F Company for merchandise that we returned to them. It was the wrong color. It was scratched. It was dented. We're going to look back and we're going to undo the transaction we just recorded. We're going to debit accounts payable and credit inventory. Does that go in the sales, purchases, cash receipts, cash payments, or general journals? Somebody blurt something out loud. Yeah. By the process of elimination, it's not a cash receipt, it's not a cash payment. We didn't buy anything, we didn't sell anything. It will only fit in the general journal. There's an illustration similar to this on page 334 in the book. And in your note-taking guide. And it doesn't look a lot different, except that we have the obligation, because we have a subsidiary ledger, we have the obligation to name the account involved. If it's accounts receivable or accounts payable, the new format will be accounts receivable dash customer or accounts payable dash creditor. We'll have to post this to the control account, and when we do, we'll put that account number in the reference column to say we posted there. 
And when we post to the subsidiary ledger, we're going to put an account number if there is, if there are account numbers in the subsidiary ledger. In our book, there are not. So we're going to put a check mark to indicate that we posted it. This will have to be posted twice to the control account and to the subsidiary ledger to maintain that equilibrium. But other than that, it looks the same. No big change in the general journal. Let's consider another transaction. We paid within the discount period. Now that credit memo illustration didn't really happen in the one I picked to illustrate. It's the goods we bought originally that we're now paying for on time. Before today, if I had asked you that, you would have debited accounts payable for the full amount. You would have credited cash for the smaller amount. You would have recorded the inventory reduction, the discount that you took because you paid on time in inventory because we were maintaining the cost principle. We wanted to know the true cost of the inventory. How will we accomplish this in the new scheme of things? Does this go in the sales, purchases, cash receipts, cash payment, or general journal say something? Yes. This is a payment of cash. Any payment of cash will go in the cash payments journal. There's a great illustration of one in your book on page 332. You should turn there and look at it sometime. But for now, if you'd like to see the one I've reproduced in the note-taking guide, that'll suffice. This very entry is the one on the 23rd. Most transactions in special journals will fit on one line. If you didn't have the privilege of having working papers at the beginning of the month or at the beginning of the year, you would write in the names of the columns at the beginning. You'd write the names of the accounts once. To journalize this transaction, you'd put the date, perhaps the check number, you would not write in this reference number or reference check mark at the moment. Here's the debit to accounts payable for the full amount. Here's the credit to, the, to cash for something less than that. Here's the credit to inventory for the amount of the discount we took on one line. When you post this to accounts payable for F company, you'll put a check mark there to indicate you posted it to their account. You'll wait until the end of the month and sum these columns. You'll post them at the end of the month if appropriate. And when you post them at the end of the month, you'll put account numbers at the bottom to indicate the account to which each of these were posted. Post column totals wherever you can. That's where the greatest time saving occurs. This is what we would have done before today. This is how it looks today. We're still accomplishing exactly the same thing. It's just more efficient. We sold merchandise. And before today, we would have bleeped it at the cash register and the technology would have recorded the revenue, debit accounts, receivable credit sales, and the expense we incurred, debit cost of goods sold, credit inventory, how can we accomplish that under the new procedures? Does this transaction go in the purchases, sales, cash receipts, cash payments, or general journal? Say something quick. Sales. This goes in the sales journal. We're going to design a sales journal to accommodate this high volume of transactions. There's one illustrated in, in the textbook on page 324. I also reproduced it in the note-taking guide for you, and this very transaction has a single column sales journal that debits accounts receivable and credit saves. But in perpetual procedures, at that same time, we also debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory. In the same way that the purchases was two amounts that really didn't have to be written down and we squeezed them into one column, we can squeeze two of these, a debit and a credit, by writing down one total. And two of these, a debit and a credit, by writing down one amount. The two entries you saw on the screen a minute ago are on that line. A date, the customer to whom you sold it because they owe us. An invoice number, optional in my opinion. 
nothing in the reference column at the time you journalize it. Sum the columns at the end of the month. Post this column twice as a debit to accounts receivable and as a credit to sales. And when you post the column total, indicate the two account numbers for the accounts to which you posted. Accounts receivable and sales. At the end of the month, sum this column and post it twice. Once as a debit to cost of goods sold and once as a credit to inventory. That's going to save a lot of time posting. The greatest time saving occurs posting. So these two entries wind up being that one entry in a sales journal. That's bound to be more efficient. That's a huge difference, a huge time saving. We received the balance due from them. Before today, we would have debited cash, we would have credited accounts receivable, we would have made it balanced by debiting sales discount. This could best be recorded in the cash receipts journal. The cash receipts journal is illustrated in the textbook on page 327. The cash receipts journal accommodates transactions just like this. Any receipt of cash should go there. This particular one happened on the 10th, and is this one. It debits cash for the smaller amount, credits accounts receivable for the full balance of their account, they don't owe anything. Debit sales discount to make it balance. Most transactions and special journals fit on one line. Hello again, and thanks for giving me this opportunity to finish the lecture that we didn't quite finish this morning in, in class. I hope you've still got your handout that was distributed in class. We've got one more page to go, and it's got some pretty important details on it. So let's take a look real quickly. As we prepare to save time posting from multi-column journals, there are some steps that we need to accomplish to expedite that process. Let me help you with those steps. The first step would be to foot. Foot's a funny word. Foot's an accounting word that means literally to add the columns. We'd want to sum each of the columns in a multi-column journal and just know what the balance was. The foot is the base of a mountain. The foot is where I'd be standing if I were in front of you in lecture today. The foot, the base, the base of this column in a multi-column journal is the noun, its foot, but the process of getting there is a verb, add it up. That is to foot, the command, foot, add it up. And then we would never want to post if there was an error. Find your errors as early as you can. So let's cross foot. Let's add up all the columns that are debit and add up all the columns that are credit and see if those are in agreement with one another. We need to cross foot. Never wait until the trial balance to find your mistake and have no idea where it is. Cross foot and find the balance, the, the, the error, the place where you're out of balance as soon as possible. Look for the mistake on that page and get that page in balance before you ever post it. Foot and then cross foot and you'll be ready to post. So the efficiency with multiple column journals comes in the recognition that many of them contain information that's all alike. Maybe they're all debits to cash or maybe they're all credits to accounts receivable. When all the items in the column are alike, they're all going the same place in the general ledger, we should be able to save the most time by posting the column total only. So that's such an important part of this process that I want to make it a rule. The rule is post column totals only. Had we gotten, this to, gotten to this point in lecture in class, I would have had you repeat that back to me. So go ahead and say it. Embarrass yourself right in front of your friends. Go ahead and say, post column totals only. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. You, you're not doing it. Post column totals only. Say it. All right. Good. I hope you did. I hope you really did. The rule is post column totals only. When can we post column totals only? When all the items in the column are alike, we can save time by not posting the individual little items. We post the column total. That's where the greatest efficiency is. Are there any exceptions to this rule, post column totals only? 
As a matter of fact, there are. There are two exceptions. Now, the exceptions are, one of the exceptions is tied directly to the way we got here. When all the items in the column are alike, we can post the column total. What if all the items are not alike? Remember that the other column in some of the journals was for miscellaneous leftover kinds of things that didn't all go the same place. Let me give you a warning. Don't ever say credit other or debit other. And that's not an acceptable answer. When you journalized in the other column, you wrote in the exact account title that you had in mind. But now this other column is all these things that are different. There is not one specific account in the general ledger to which they can be posted. We need to post them individually. Individual items from the other column are posted to the general ledger. The second exception is columns named what subsidiary ledgers are named. If the name of the column is accounts receivable or accounts payable, then that individual item needs to be posted to the appropriate account named in that ledger. If the name of the column is accounts payable, then it's some creditor that you bought from that you need to post to. If it's accounts receivable, then there's some customer's name given in the accounts receivable ledger you would need to post to that account. There is a simple example on the last page of the handout for us to go through to demonstrate these steps. Foot, cross foot, post column totals wherever you can, post individual items from other, post individual items from columns called accounts receivable and accounts payable. Let's take a look at the sample. It's a partial cash receipts journal. Let's look at the steps that we need to apply to this. The first thing you do when you post from a multi-column journal like this is foot. So you could add these columns yourself. You might see the totals on the screen if you want to practice a couple and see that I got them right. I hope I did. Then you might do that. The cash debit total is 37,011. The sales discount debit column is 439 and so forth. You, those numbers are available to you. I'm going to let you rely on the visual there for that. Then we need to cross foot. We need to make sure of the accuracy of this before we would post to the ledger. So let's look at the two columns labeled debit. That would be the cash column and the sales discount column. Let's sum those two totals. 37,011 and 439 need to be summed. If you want to do it, I'm not going to do it for you. Write it down and remember that total. And let's compare that to the three totals labeled credit. Accounts receivable is credit, sales is credit, and the other account is also credit. Now that's all I'm illustrating on the screen, but on the handout, there's another column there that stands all on its own. It's cost of goods sold debit and merchandise inventory credit. So that's both a debit and a credit, and that's not causing the equilibrium. That column balances on its own. So we're only concerned about these three labeled credits. So sum those three, 21,950, 4,500 and 11,000 and compare it to the total that you got for the two debits. They have to be in agreement. If they are not in agreement, the mistake is right here on this page. Find the mistake before you post. Find the mistake before you post. So once we're sure that we have cross-footed, that debits and credits equal in this journal, we're now ready to post. Remember the rule is post column totals only. And remember, we're able to do that when all the items in the column are alike. So in the cash column, there are six items, and they are all debits to cash. In the old days, we would post all six of them individually. But here's where the time saving comes. These six items can all be posted once. Now, there could just as easily have been 600 items or 6,000 items during the month. Think of the efficiency that would occur if we can sum all of these totals all of these individual items and post once at the end of the month. We are not going to post the individual items. We are going to post the column total. Only the $37,011 will be posted as a debit to the cash account at the end of the month. Cash is in the general ledger. We're going to post to the cash account as a debit in the general ledger. The same is true of the sales discount column. We're going to post that total only. These two individual items are both alike. They're both being posted 
it, they're both debits to the account sales discount. We don't need to post them individually. We can post them all at once. And when we post the 439 to the sales discount account in the general ledger as a debit, we'll return to this analysis and we'll put the account number for sales discount at the bottom of that account, bottom of that column, to indicate that we have posted. I don't think I mentioned the first one. The debit to cash was posted to the general ledger and I put the account number for cash under that column to indicate that I had posted it. The accounts receivable column is one of the other exceptions. Columns named accounts receivable and accounts payable need to be posted individually. These two will be posted individually and will be posted as a total to the control account in the general ledger. There are credits to accounts receivable. One to Abbott Sisters. That $10,600 amount to Abbott Sisters needs to be posted as a credit to their account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. The same thing would be true of B Company. That $11,350 credit needs to be posted to their account in the subsidiary ledger for B Company. And when you have posted to Abbott Sisters and B Company, then return to this journal and put check marks beside both those amounts in the reference column to indicate that both the 10,000 figure and the 11,000 figure have been posted to their respective accounts. Both accounts have been updated by this accounts receivable credit. We've posted detailed information to the subsidiary ledger. In order for the subsidiary ledger and the control account to equal one another, we'll also need to post to the control account. The total, 21950 needs to be posted as a credit to accounts receivable in order for us to maintain this equilibrium between subsidiary ledger and control account. Post summary information to the control account and detailed information to the subsidiary, and then compare to see if they agree with one another. The posting reference notation, in this case assuming an account number of four, is placed below the accounts receivable total to indicate that we posted that total to the general ledger account. That pretty much covers the, the details of this. What we do is apply this over and over again. The same would be true with the sales column. We would post the column total and not the individual items. The other accounts have already been posted individually. We would not post the column total to the other account. We would only post the individual totals, the individual entries to the accounts that be, we specified when we journalized the transaction. I hope this is helpful to you in learning the concept and applying the concept, but in doing your homework. I'm hoping that as you read the instructions of the problem, you'll read them literally, that you'll understand them better because you watch this video, and that you'll be able to apply them. I hope you have a great week in accounting.